Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to punch, chop, and kick your way through the greatest era of action movies. We took a little break and it was an unannounced break. We're just like, hey, um, see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs> well, actually, we didn't say that. We waited to the end and we're like, hey, by the way, <laughs> we were gone. Well, I had to disappear for a little bit because uh, I-, I bought a house and it turns out buying a house is hard. <laughs> It is. It is. In fact, that's all I was saying on Twitter and Instagram. If you follow us over there, which if, if you're not like, <laughs> but <laughs> if you follow us on one of our social channels, that's where I was talking about, hey, what's going on? And it, since April, end of April, it has been busy, to say the least, for us, for most of the world, the chaotic world that it has been in 2020. It, that just won't quit. It has been chaotic, and it just finally caught up to us at this this summer after we moved across the country. I took a new job. John moves, buys a house. We have school starting. Like everything just started compounding. It's like you know what? We're gonna take a little break here. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, we don't have a set time limit for these things. No uh, producers breathing down our necks. No, but because we pause, that allows the world to continue into this chaos run. And that even bleeds into our world of punching, chopping, and kicking for the greatest era of action movies. We have a threat, people, people. There is a direct threat against our way of life. The people who love our movies, these kinds of movies, the people that listen to this podcast, there is a direct threat and it's done by none other than Sylvester Stallone himself, who said that he's going to make a director's cut of Rocky IV. Sounds okay. Okay, whatever. There might be some extra footage. And he's cutting the robot out of Rocky IV. He does not like robots anymore. (laughs) He is mad with power and he must be stopped. He specifically said he does not like the robot anymore. No more robot. The robot's going in the garbage bin. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> you are cut off from the Go With Me podcast. We are not doing one of your movies. But if you want to get interviewed, we're not doing... <laughs> if you want to, if you want to do an interview about why you're cutting just, the robot, we're here. I to can't listen. believe he's going. I can't believe he's going all George Lucas. Robot scenes, the, one of the best, and it's like one of the most memorable scenes too. And it's hilarious. <laughs> It's too silly, according to him. For Rocky IV. Yeah. So uh, (laughs) when was Rocky IV made again? End of the 80s. Or like mid 80s. I'm just, uh, everything was silly in the 80s. Watch any action (laughs) movie. (laughs) Well, the silliness continued into the 90s. So let's get to the movie that we are talking about in this week's episode. We are talking about the February 23rd, 1990 action movie titled Angel Town. It is directed by Eric Carson. Now, when you hear Eric Carson's, like his his filmography, you would think we would end up with a better movie. <laughs> well, you'd be mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tipping my hand a little bit because I'm like, by the end of this breakdown, I, I hope to make up my mind on whether or not I think this is a good or a bad movie because I'm, I'm legit in the middle on this. So we'll see at the end of this breakdown. But Eric Carson, because we got to type. And we can pick them even without having any prior knowledge about the movie. We know exactly where it's going to fit. He directed The Octagon. Ninjas. Could it be? Ninjas. <laughs> that Chuck Norris movie. He also directed like, Black Eagle. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> he also directed Black Eagle starring JCVD and then produced Lionheart, and even appearing in the movie. Which we're going to come back to that Lionheart thing. Yeah, yeah. That's going to come sound very familiar once we get a little further in the breakdown. It is written by S. Warren. That's literally the credit. <laughs> S. Warren, which is just shruggy for if they exist or not. <laughs> Apparently, the writer did not want their name put on this movie. Apparently, they still don't want it on there. <laughs> they haven't come out to claim it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't put my name on that. <laughs> I don't know. Put S. Warren or something. <laughs> Warren. <laughs> I just wrote it as a favor. <laughs> and the reason why we chose this movie, to be totally honest with you, 100%, if you listen to our prep meetings, I published that into the feed. If you didn't listen to it, you missed why we chose this. Because it's a super secret, deep down, dirty secret that we got for this podcast. We were legit out of fucking movies. We We were like, we need one for Los Angeles. (laughs) No, not because he's representing France. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Yeah, I forget. We need one for France. He's representing 
So he's representing the international community, the of, of pretty much he's Europe for for the podcast. Not a city in <laughs> for, for this season. All of Europe, so which I think is supported throughout the movie because we see some flashbacks that clearly aren't in France. We knew nothing, literally nothing about this movie, other than it took place in the era that we were looking and had like one of those people that like, oh yeah, he won awards for kickboxing or taekwondo or whatever. Like, okay, that perfect. Action movie, 1990, some guy that's good at boxing. Like, let's just go for got it. Got it. Yeah, we got to go for it because we couldn't pick a bunch of New York movies even though we wanted to. So we just kind of stumbled onto this movie. And I, I said a little bit in the very, very beginning is that I can't make up my mind if this is a good movie or a bad movie because as we got into it, there's actually lots of surprises. <laughs> yeah. Not saying all of them are good. I'm like, and I, in my head, I'm like, and none mm-hmm. of that is a good thing. <laughs> Without much further ado, let's go break down 1990s Angel Town. Okay, so when we open up, you know, you know, if you watch these movies, the sign of a, that you're going to have a fantastic time, an amazing time, is that the movie is going to open with a song about the title oh, of yeah. the movie. That is always a guarantee yes. you're in for a great time. Yeah. Blurs a little bit. Got us like Brian Adams or <laughs> Sean Mullins, at least. <laughs> you mean you did not like that song, Angel Town, which was literally just a retelling of the story that was about to happen? It was kind of like in the 90s where they put yeah. a rap song at the end where they're like, this is what happened in the movie, but in rap form. This was like... <laughs> yeah, so I was hoping we are going to hear Melissa rap. <laughs> no. <laughs> Can you give us a few verses to Angel Town? <laughs> yeah, how would that sound in rap? No, I can't. <laughs> I can't. I mean, in my head, I can, but not out loud. No. I will work on that later. <laughs> <laughs> they also legit played the entire song. Yes. You get the whole thing. That's yeah. what I'm saying. It's why it's the whole story because it's the whole entire song, which is suspiciously oh. like a movie much last time never. Never Too Young to Die. There's a title song it that is Never Too forever. Young to Die. <laughs> it's Never Too Young to Die. And that you get to listen to the entire song during the opening mm-hmm. credits. Yep. Man. Man, it feels like there's another movie like, oh, like Deadly, Deadly Something. Like they had the same type of approach. We just got the whole song. But that was horrible music. <laughs> yeah. Get that straight. Yeah, that that song was like better. five minutes too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Angel Town sounded like it was a Grammy winner compared to the song that was in Deadly Bet. <laughs> well, <laughs> Angel Town made people so angry that a full blown race war broke out in an alley. <laughs> it definitely didn't fit the song that the was Crips going on. The Bloods joined forces against like the Rednecks okay, that came out of know. nowhere. There is some, I think someone needs to do some research on gangs because there was like some, some people showing up with red and blue together. They were walking up and there were people wearing brown and yellow and they were all like coming to, uh, all coming in the same car. I thought that was like against the rules. (laughs) Well, this is weird thing, kind of dynamic throughout the movie that goes unexplained where it's like, it's not just the gangs that are fighting, but it's the gangs and then like the college kids kind of deal. (laughs) Because there's a couple it's times true. where it's like they're, they they just randomly show up and start beating up college kids. And it's like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, everyone wants to beat up college kids. All right. I mean, I think it was to show like the, the gang's just out of control. It just, it comes off like there's some kind of grudge with these college kids. <laughs> maybe they what don't they like. against <laughs> USC. I was going to say, maybe they don't like yuppies, okay? <laughs> 1990. It wouldn't be that much longer until it's like the Matt Liner, Reggie Bush oh, era God. of. Yeah. Like, is that like, oh, no, you know, no, no. Ni- that was ni- two, 96 that was like 2000. 2000. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, oh. that's what I'm saying. It's like, so it's like right before all that. Like, oh, before all the they, cheating? They were ha- yeah. Before the Pete Carroll. <laughs> before Pete Carroll. <laughs> you mean the cheating? <laughs> <laughs> and the taking money. Oh, yeah, that's Before right. they were good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> when they do that dummy dressed up like Reggie Bush off the roof. Remember that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways, this is, what's great about it is that there's this full-blown race war that's happening. Meanwhile, there's a guy, we don't haven't met him yet, there's a guy waiting in the car. He's just watching them like, oh, my boys. Yeah, I don't understand what is going on with that either. <laughs> Meanwhile, at a cemetery <laughs> Meanwhile, somewhere else. in France... 
We don't know where. <laughs> I think it's somewhere on the other side of town. Like he's got to be there in, in no, LA no, already. No, right? no, he's in France because he is. Yeah, it's, it's his French girlfriend who's like, "Don't leave me. Look at my titties." Yeah, well, because <laughs> the, the taxi driver has a French accent too. Yeah, that's what he, got yeah. me. Was that was like yeah. he's at the cemetery and this girl's begging him not to leave. And she strips naked, and they have sex in the cemetery, which is weird to begin with, because, like, I mean... <laughs> it's a cemetery. The cemetery is kind of creepy, so... <laughs> I, I, I mean, whatever floats your boat. But why the hell is he going to L.A. again? Fred seems to be pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why are you leaving that behind? <laughs> I also noticed, this is when I first started to think, like, man, this guy, this actor, Olivier Gruner, sounds really familiar. <laughs> like, this accent... Now, it's really weird that they're in France and they speak in English, but with French accents. <laughs> Never really mind weird, that, though. First of all. <laughs> Never mind that. Second of all, that cab driver just, like, watched the whole time that they're just banging in the cemetery. <laughs> didn't do nothing. Didn't call the police. Didn't do Hell nothing. yeah. <laughs> well, wouldn't you? Come on. Like, if you were there, if you were there, Uber, wouldn't you watch? Wait, she was going to call the police on that? <laughs> <laughs> in the cemetery. <laughs> They're dead. They'll never know. <laughs> Just saying. But, I bet you he got a four-star rating. <laughs> but I'm like, man, this guy sounds really familiar. I can't put my finger on it. And I'm like writing notes about the movie and scrolling Twitter. And up at the exact same time comes this tweet about underwear and jackets. <laughs> like, oh, my God. It reminds That's what it is. He sounds just like Tommy Wiseau. He wishes, though. <laughs> He wishes he could be that caliber of an actor. <laughs> Guys, I kind of feel bad for it. Uh, uh, Oliver Gruner. He's a former French Special Forces, or I guess they would call it the Commando Marine National. So he's dude's like French Special Forces stationed in Somalia and stuff. He was also hmm. the first French kickboxing champion. He defended his title two times. And in 1986, became the world middleweight kickboxing champion. Just on a whim, he got noticed at Cannes. At Cannes Film Festival, and he retired from fighting to pursue acting after he got a shot in this movie. This movie doesn't do terribly well. <laughs> he follows it up with a sci fi movie called Nemesis in 1992, where he plays a cyborg cop who is sent after his cyborg par partner slash lover, who is to stop them from giving sensitive information to the cyborg terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of cyborgs. <laughs> yeah, and then he would follow that up in 95 with Automatic, which where he plays an android that protects humans in the future. So, <laughs> well, um, I mean, it's got to be in the future if he's an android. <laughs> so I just, I feel bad because you could see his path. Like, Angel Town didn't work out, and then he started doing sci-fi movies, and then it was some direct video and then some martial arts stuff. Guys, he still acts at something called The Target, which is looks like his newest project. And then there's rumors of Cyborg Nemesis, mm. which might have to, The Dark Rift, which I think might have to do with the old Nemesis, which, you know, maybe he, he has to come back and save his cyborg lover. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? It's rumored. He also had three movies entitled The Circuit, uh, one, two, and three. So I just, mostly I feel bad because I feel like if you, after we watch this movie and you find out that the director pretty much after this went, all right, guys, I know we can do better. And then made Lionheart with Jean-Claude Van Damme. And then he had the big acting career. And you just got to think like, man, he's doing, he's playing a cyborg or an android looking at Jean-Claude Van Damme with, Dennis Rodman, like, that could have been me. Should have been me. <laughs> I don't know so, who got the but... raw end of the deal on that one. <laughs> he may not be an epic actor, but he is a legitimate badass. Special forces, middleweight champion, kickboxing champion of the world. Like, he's legit. Just doomed to play cyborg cops. <laughs> After the cemetery fucking. <laughs> 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 Sorry, the, sci the cemetery loving. <laughs> he makes his way to the United States to USC, and <laughs> he's on campus, and he's attending some sort of special graduate program. There, special guests to the dean, but everyone treats him like shit. Even no, the I, dean. No, the dean likes him. The dean is the one who likes him. It's the it's the guy who's the head of his department who the dean 
specifically went out and got him, him from France to piss off this guy who's the department oh, head. Oh, that's why. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, that's what. It's ah, okay. I was having trouble with that dynamic too. I was like, <laughs> is he auditing this class? Like, what's he doing here? I love that both <laughs> of you guys were like, I don't know what the hell is going on. Like, well, the mark of a great B movie is that they have <laughs> subplots that go. Just keeps hanging out. <laughs> the mark of a great B movie is that there's subplots that go nowhere, and the school subplot goes nowhere. Uh, yeah, no, it goes to like two more scenes and you're like, so this is the whole reason he came to the to the States. He's not going to go back to school. He can't be passing. <laughs> Weird coincidence. In real life, Gruner's younger brother, I believe, is an engineer. And he, in the school, he's studying engineering. I wonder if he came up with that himself. I thought, oh my God, I thought you were going to say he really was an engineer. And then I was going to go like, no, he's not. <laughs> That's a lie. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine you're Dolph Lundgren and you're, and you're watching this movie and you're like, no, that's not what's wrong with that math equation. <laughs> this is what's wrong with it. Also, I could have kicked that guy harder than you exactly. kicked him. Exactly. Also, I got a bigger dick. So <laughs> <that> is... <laughs> All around. <laughs> the trouble that Jacques, of course his name is Jacques. Uh, what... There's no other French names. It's only the one. <laughs> the entire country is named Jacques. <laughs> <laughs> they all smoke cigarettes and go. Wee <laughs> wee. Oui, oui. <laughs> but the only trouble he runs into, everything goes swimmingly. He comes to to USC. Yeah, he's got a jerk for a teacher, but he's he's living his best life. But he can't find anywhere that will rent to him because he's there late. Okay, but he could have found somewhere if he just had been willing to take public transportation. <laughs> She's like, these are the places where they're within walking distance of the school. <laughs> well, if I if I saw that neighborhood, I would be taking the bus. He has money. He's mm -hmm. not poor. He saved up all his money so he could come to America to do this program. Take a bus. <laughs> all everywhere's rented except in the bad neighborhood. And I love to indicate that it's the bad neighborhood. They're playing music and someone's playing a like a carburetor, like a drum. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the rough neighborhood. They listen to loud music and, and, and bang on trash cans. And well, we all know what the real indication that it's a bad neighborhood because he goes around all these places who still have their four rent signs up. but tell them to hit the bricks. They're all so, white. Yeah. He you know, talks to all these white people, and they're like, no, sorry, we got nothing. But then he has to go over to where the Mexicans are. And that's the poor neighborhood because there's Mexicans there. That's our signal. Yeah, like he crossed the line. Remember, it was like he was looking across the street, and there were these white people riding bikes. And he's like, oh, I really want to be over there. He's a look like, I'd rather be over there. Then he looks over at the poor Mexicans. They don't even have instruments. They're just banging on carburetors. <laughs> That's what I'm they talking about. They can't even afford carburetors. They, they, they can't even put the carburetor in their car. <laughs> <laughs> they just bang on it. Yes. <laughs> the two signs of a bad neighborhood. A, there's Hispanics there. Yes. B, kids in jaunty hats. It's <laughs> always the sign of a bad neighborhood. Also, kids with some badass haircuts. <laughs> some of those boys had some sick, like, mullets, like, feathered back mullets, and they were like, ten. <laughs> <laughs> well, Melissa, as our resident Mexican... <laughs> <laughs> on staff i'm wearing my jaunty hat <laughs> did you also live next to a school bus actually at one point yes i did <laughs> and, and all three of us having lived in south merced which those of you from northern california know what we're talking about <laughs> yeah you know like ninth and r street like kind of in that yeah. range so you know if, if you know anything about merced you know what kind of neighborhood we were in going across the railroad tracks may look rough from the outside but those are the best neighborhoods exactly we got the best food i don't know what the hell you're talking about we got trucks that deliver pastries to your house <laughs> i know i tell people about that all the time and people are blown away it's like like you didn't you didn't have that yeah well you suck <laughs> you live in a bad neighborhood yeah, you have the big box it's got all the pastries on it Rings the bell. Yes. <laughs> the tamales in the cool. And on like the, Tuesdays, the, the big guy used to come around. Yeah, the tamale guy would come around with a big stick and knock on our door. <laughs> right. I love that. <laughs> I got time to walk to your door. <laughs> you want these or not? <laughs> What's great is that they actually measured and figured out exactly how long the stick needed to be, <laughs> just in case you got a long driveway. Like if you need a little buffer room. <laughs> 
Hey, credit to that guy. The, the truth about that neighborhood, it's not a roughy. If you knock on someone's door, they're going to kill you. That's, no, that's not going to happen. Actually, almost all the people are great. It's actually one of the best neighborhoods we ever lived in. A food aside, mm-hmm. yes. we, we loved all the neighbors. We fit in really well in that neighborhood. What you don't know is that when you knock on the door, a pit bull might come running out the front door. Yeah. And you need to be prepared to defend yourself. <laughs> With a stick. <laughs> <laughs> he finally finds a place that he can rent after all day of searching. I think it was like 10 minutes of walking. <laughs> <laughs> Got about two finds- blocks. Like, <laughs> fine, I'll take this place. But he has that flashback of when he was a kid running from other kids that were going to bully him and hiding in the trunk of a car. He's like, oh, yeah, I feel at home here. This yeah. is like, this yeah, is like, like where, where I grew up. Uh, what's well, okay is he scares the kids off and gets the kid out of the trunk and the kid flips him off. Tells him, the, <laughs> what do you want, fucking metal? That's what he says. <laughs> That's what's great about those neighborhoods. Mind your own fucking business. Yeah. This is involved. Me. Yeah. <laughs> he meets Maria and her mother-in-law. Mother. Uh, I can't name? remember her name. It actually never wrote a name down because I always just referred to her as a boy. <laughs> Mother Adon- Adonis. Yeah, Mother Adonis. That's yeah. what they call her. He meets them for literally five minutes and says, I, I got to run. I got to go back to the school. I got this big event that's happening tonight. I got to meet the head of the engineering department. And Mother Adonis presses his suit for him. Even though, who, who, who does that for them? <laughs> press your own suit. You just got here. I'm an old lady. I'm watching Aww. my shows. I don't got time to press your suit. <laughs> I'm telling you, your grandma would have ironed my suit if I asked. No, her yeah, to. no. My grandma would. Uh, my, if I asked my grandma right now, she'd iron a suit for me and ship it to me. Me, I need their suit. I got to get this done. <laughs> the mixer so goes we jump well. to the party, and, yeah. and we get to meet. We get to meet the university's Joe Biden. <laughs> I don't know how the hell they got him. That was a big swig. swing. <laughs> <laughs> it goes relatively well. I mean, for for old white man, he does okay. Like he tells it. <laughs> He's a huge jerk. What are really, you talking he only about? says one sexist thing. That's not bad. <laughs> old white man could have done a lot worse. <laughs> he ta- he just <laughs> annihilates everybody. He annihilates everybody that talks to him. He tells that one girl like. Oh, yeah, I knew your dad. He told me he always wanted a son. And how does that feel to never live up yes. to that? She's like, um, I don't know. <laughs> then he goes over to Jock and says, you're too stupid to be. I don't even know why I'm you're talking a, to you. Because you're, you're a jock. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, he got the scholarship on an Olympic scholarship because the football team got suspended or, or sanctioned or something. Yeah. yeah. And the dean's all pumped about it. So apparently the dean hates the football team. That's why the dean was excited because that, whatever the head of the department hates football. And he's been for years, he's been trying to get the football team like to not be so important to the school. And so it, that was his way Like it got whatever, something happened with this football team and it got screwed over. And so the dean's way of like paying that guy back was giving a jock this spot, this coveted spot in the program. Gotcha. <laughs> is the do- kickboxing like the door still in the Olympics? <laughs> did they, did, uh, do they still have that in? Yeah. Yeah. It is. Okay. Yeah. Like, as far as I know. No, that's actually one of the more legitimate ones. That's one of the ones that actually doesn't, you know, require brooms or some sort of hammer. <laughs> <laughs> or bows and arrows. <laughs> The best is the cross country skiing. Or oh, the one where you gun. ski and shoot at the same <laughs> yeah, time. The like, that, how does that ever come into play? <laughs> I know. One time I was cross country skiing and I And there's no there. downhill. It's like level the whole way. <laughs> like, maybe, maybe if you were good at shooting targets while going downhill, that would be impressive. But, like, going straight where you could just, like, stop and stand level, like, that's not impressive. Oh, fuck you, snow people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get some strongly worded letters from Canada. <laughs> so this is the moment when the gang shows up just to fuck around with the college kids or something. Like, they have, they're they not going to actually shoot anyone. They just came to, like, harass them. And luckily, Jacques is there to take care of business. But they weren't actually going to do it. They were just going over there to mess with them. They were going over and mess with them, but then they, but those, then the college students started to fight them, and then the college students were getting their ass kicked. <laughs> so the French guys like, God damn it, I just got here. I got to go help these stupid yuppies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't even say thank you when they're done. No, they give like a slant oh, look God. as they walk away. They're like, well, 
well, you should get those things registered as <laughs> lethal and then leave. We're going to go put on our sweaters and sip wine. Sorry, we got to go. <laughs> Damn you, California. <laughs> so then when he's done, we see another flashback of him back in France where he killed the guy. He's a murderer. And then he sees his own dad get killed. Because his dad's trying to help him run from the police. The police are coming. He's trying to get him to run. But the police just shoot at the dad. So is back. that why he hates minorities? <laughs> I'm just saying he beats up a lot of Mexicans. So. <laughs> I mean, but the cops just gunned down that the dad without even like, mm, yeah, like they didn't, there was no big altercation. They just shot him. <laughs> also, for the record, if you take all the flashback scenes and put them together in one story, it doesn't make any fucking sense. <laughs> and, <it does. laughs> and why do we get a flashback of his third grade teacher calling him a loser? Like, how is that important at all? <laughs> Everybody's third grade teacher calling him a loser. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> this so I, I do want to address this because it just keeps getting worse as we do the flashbacks and stuff and then once we meet his buddy they were trying too hard with his backstory to make him some kind of mysterious badass he could just be good at, at kickboxing like he didn't have to have this oh he lives in all these different places and this flashback to him being a murderer and <laughs> <laughs> so like i don't think it helped the the plot of fighting gang members at all it had nothing to do with the plot and it never actually connected any dots it was just like look at this he <laughs> <laughs> he's french <laughs> he's bad in school got it he killed a man on I, accident I mean, clearly I, I guess they were trying to say he was a, a troubled youth or something. But I think the point they were trying to make is what later on when he spe when we speak to his friend, he's saying like he's always lived in the ghetto. He lived in the ghetto in France when we met him in Hong Kong, but we didn't get no flashbacks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, you could use a flashback on that actual aspect. <laughs> he will, he lived in the ghettos of Hong Kong. He just always yeah. lives in these places, and like for some reason, he chooses these places to live, and he fights every. Maybe he just goes around murdering people <laughs> in every place he goes. So that brings up another point. Does that mean he's like fifty? Like how old is he really? <laughs> I don't know how. How old do you think he's supposed to be? Because he's not college age. I think in the movie he's supposed to be like. In and his early 20s. <laughs> yeah, he's supposed to be like 22, 23 no, years old. No. Yeah. He's got it because he's going to school. He, but he's going no, to graduate I was thinking school, like 35. <laughs> 47 on a good day. <laughs> it's that bowl haircut. That's what does like, throws you off on his age. <laughs> No, it's his dry well, ass lips. I was just going to say, like, <laughs> like, so he's like early 40s and he's beating up a bunch of 15, 16 year olds. And so this is really a beef between two, like, 40 year old, him and that 40 year old gang leader. So two old guys. So the next day, Martin is apologizing to Jacques and Jacques has a chance to talk to Maria. He's, far, he's starting to find out a little bit more about the family. But outside is when the gang comes back. Now, I think, am I remembering right, that Maria leaves, and then it's just Martine and Jacques that are there. No, and no. And Frank tips off. No, oh, that's right. He's walking. He's walking, mm -hmm. Maria. Yeah, it's all of them are there. Martine's like, yeah, you know, I think my mom would be happy if you stay, because apparently I can't take care of her. Because you can't. <laughs> but yeah, but then he goes to leave. And she goes to leave, and they're there. They stop her at the door. The gangster stop at the door, and then he's like, "Let me walk you." So then it's just Martine and the grandma are home by themselves. Then yeah, and that, that's when Frank like tips them off. Hey, these guys are not like, gonna go ambush the house. So Jacques lets Maria walk alone, and he mm -hmm. goes back help it, and just starts destroying people. Which is always this mystery with Jacques throughout the movie: is that is he a nonviolence just trying to help, or does he want to fucking destroy people? I don't know, but because like it felt like <laughs> yeah. he was killing all those people, like <laughs> snapping necks. Stuff, I'm like, are these yeah. dead? Because I'm confused. I thought he was just yeah. supposed to be knocking them out. Uh, that's what I was thinking. Like, especially that but by the time we get to the end, like that last fight is brutal. There's just so many dead, uh, dead gang members <laughs> by the end of it. Even in this scene, the first guy he gets, he holds him and then he starts punching him in the back. He's just repeatedly punching him in the spine yeah. to kill him. He just paralyzes yeah, him. Yeah, that guy wasn't even fighting back. <laughs> Like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> Let him know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you mess with Jacques. Inside, Mama Ordonez passes out. Made out later that she had a heart attack and she dies. Martine was trying to be inside protecting her. He had a gun. He had, like, put a board up o over the door. Jacques gets in. He's able to get Mama Ordonez over to the neighbor's house to hide her. And then Martine and Jacques go on the run. 
because Martin was getting the crap kicked out of him. They were just beating him up good. Yeah, and they, th- so this gang is locked in on Martin. This leads to Jacques trying to get Martin out and to kind of a safe place, and this leads him to taking him to a friend of his. Apparently, he has a friend in L.A. who has a dojo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he does it in the very 80s way where he looks in a phone book, finds the ad, and tears the page out. By the way, I know phone books don't exist much anymore, but that is very rude. Other people don't use that phone book. <laughs> Why are you ripping that page out? What if I need to find that dojo? <laughs> Or the place on the back. <laughs> I'll never be able to find it. Uh-huh. That. Oh, that always was frustrating. Because it's like, you know, if you're looking for a restaurant, they rip the front page out. It's like, of course, you know, takes the back page with it. <laughs> so, very rude. It's also very interesting that he wasn't willing to take a bus and he clearly had a place that he could have stayed. Exactly. He could have stayed with Henry the whole time. <laughs> but he didn't want to tell him he was there. It's like, oh, <laughs> What are you doing and here? Henry <laughs> loves Jacques. He yeah. loves. You see the way he looks at him? Oh, smiling. Like he which wants is, to kiss him. <laughs> which is my conspiracy theory here on why he didn't reach out to Henry when he came to LA and why they're like kind of like they have, they, they have a lot of like quarrels with each other throughout Lover's the movie. squirrels. Because the wife <laughs> really loves Jacques and Henry does see, but they have like that kind of off about it, which plays a lot like oh. a Easter Mama Tam the end. <laughs> Type moment where they're like, all, all three like of them have done some. Yes, in Hong Kong, that's what happened in Hong Kong, mm-hmm. and then they split up. Uh, and like, that's they why have there's the lover no around flashback. anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's an X-rated flashback. My conspiracy theory of what was happening in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, we get Martine in the hiding, and uh, we get to see Jacques show off how much of a badass he is. So Jacques, the real kickboxer, fucking badass. Yeah. Jacques, the actor fighting, bad. Not Just bad good. acting, yeah. <laughs> but it shows It shows that the, watching this and knowing that they immediately made Lionheart next, they definitely had a checklist. So they went, okay, we need a guy with a French accent. Check. He can do the splits, <laughs> right? Yes. Check. Martial yeah, arts? Yeah. yeah. Check. Okay. <laughs> Awkward with women. Yep. All right. Hip. He's the guy. <laughs> but we want him to be attractive. Not check. <laughs> Put a bowl on his head and cut his hair. No. <laughs> and that's what we've been hinting at this entire time is that this movie is Lionheart, but they missed. And, and then there's so many people that worked on this movie that later worked on Lionheart. So, for example, because we always got to watch the credits, stick around for the movie, watch the credits. See all the funny names that come up. There's all kinds of wacky stuff that comes in there. <laughs> mm-hmm. As the credits were rolling, I saw that the second assistant film director was Bambi Sikafus, which is a great name. <laughs> she also worked on Lionheart. Uh, there's <laughs> other actors and the director. And there's like all kinds of other crossovers here. Like Olivier oh, Gruner yeah. yes. worked on Lionheart. Not acting in it. No. Thank God. <laughs> we dodged a bullet. No. <laughs> but yeah, it's the same thing movies. when we get into music. A lot of the people in music were also on that soundtrack as well. Yes, exactly. So they're like, listen, the story is roughly here, but we just picked the wrong actor. <laughs> <laughs> we picked the wrong badass, guys. <laughs> What if we got a we better thought French, actor? <laughs> we thought French Special Forces. Turns out we needed Van Damme. <laughs> <laughs> Legionnaires. We needed Legionnaires, not French Special Legionnaires. <laughs> yes. And I feel like when JCVD goes into audition, like in this era, goes into, into audition for movies, they're like, okay, listen, we just missed it. We're looking for another actor that's going to come in. We're going to tweak the role a little bit. Uh, hello, Mr. Jean-Claude. What's your what's your pitch on why you should be in this movie? It's like, well, they call me the muscles from Brussels. Okay, so when can you start? <laughs> also, I can do the split. Watch. <laughs> See? No, no, no. See, I see it as the, I, 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 this guy was incredibly brave when he did Lionheart because he just did Angel Town. It didn't work. And then the first guy that shows up to audition sounds just like the guy who just didn't work in Angel Town. <laughs> and it's like, guys, we've been here before. French accent splits. Come on, guys. Are you sure? <laughs> Yeah, but he had already done, like, Bloodsport and stuff like that when he did that movie. Yeah. So yeah. He's had that under his belt. Do you think the story you so Olivia Gruber <laughs> to try and beat 
Like, see, this is it could have been you, JCVD. Then it would have worked. Yeah, <laughs> like that was their selling point. Apparently, <laughs> they're like, like, listen, we're gonna tweak the story a little bit so it makes sense. We're gonna get rid of the flashbacks and we're gonna have a good actor. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> There's this great moment where Jacques is talking to Henry and Jacques is explaining how he's like the Muhammad Ali of kickboxing. <laughs> Essentially, you know. five world titles, and he's a badass at math. <laughs> yep, he's like one of those guys that could just do it all. He just like chooses something to learn, and then this is his new thing. Engineering is his new thing to do. They go back to Maria's house. I, was he going to go just introduce Henry to Maria? No, he got to tell. Mar- he's got to go tell Maria where where oh, she's where, right. where, where he just Martin stole her is. son. Yeah. Because all they do is drive up and see that. Mama Ardonias is dead, and then they leave, which I keep wanting to call her Mama Coco, which is a different movie. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, I mean, at this point the same, in the movie, but... I am locked in on the Lee Karate minivan with the, uh, <laughs> with the placards Astro on man. the side. Dude, and he busses them around for the rest of the movie. Like, why didn't he get a hold of Lee earlier? The other thing that I, I forgot to mention, and that's what's great, what's so great about these movies, is that when you meet the other karate master, they're always doing the same thing. When you come into the gym, like, oh, yeah, this guy, he's going to be great. How do you know he's great? He's beating the fuck out of his own students. <laughs> he has 12-year-olds on the ground bleeding. <laughs> Just annihilating them. It is like in every movie. In yeah. every movie, it's the same way. No retreat, no surrender. The last dragon. Like, they're all the same yep. way. You come walking, like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. this guy, he's the best. You come When they come walking in, even Tiger Claw. Yeah. This is like, come walking in, this guy's the best. Watch. He's beating the fuck out of his own people. Exactly. And they just deal with it. <laughs> by the way, Henry is played by Peter Kwong. And he is a veteran of film, TV, and stage. He's best known for playing Rain in Big Trouble in Little China. And he also uh, Tommy Tong in Eddie Murphy's Golden Child. Mm, I didn't know that. Uh, he's also in, in more recent movies. He was also in Cooties with Elijah Wood, which is an underrated movie. In the bio... Of his IMBD, he claims to have been in over 100 film and TV, but IMBD only counts 84. (laughs) So, and they show that number when you click on filmography. So, just saying. Somewhere. He has a Vice credit. (laughs) He has a Vice credit. He was in an episode of Vice. He's also an honorary member of the LA Mime Guild. So, I guess that means he's a mime. He's super. It, it's that. actually it, it's an honorary membership because he's super active in, in like stage productions. He's like on all kinds of award boards and stuff like that. So he didn't even earn the mime. <laughs> Not even a fucking mime. I don't know. Maybe he's a mime. <laughs> Uh, he also he's also been featured dancing in a few music videos, including Ed Sheeran's song "Sing." Damn, uh, he, he's the kar- no he's the karaoke guy. He is a verified badass. He studied Northern Shaolin Kung Fu and teaches Tai Chi Chun uh, uh, Chuan now. Hmm. So, well, I, I guess in between acting. For those of you who listened to our last episode that we published, where we talked about a very special movie in our heart which is the one that John was unfortunately missed for Never Too Young to Die, you will recognize Peter Kwong as John Stamos' best friend Mm -hmm. who builds that grenade launcher out of stuff he found in his dorm room and takes absolute glee. He loves it. (laughs) He's smart and he can build everything and he's got tech. He's like, I got that stuff off the disc and I've got it. And also I can blow you up. (laughs) Is it weird that I could see Kwong's character Lee and... Peter hanging out with Stamos. Yeah. <laughs> like, it just seems to fit. Like, that that group. And this is what I'm talking about, that we don't, we just have a type. We don't, we didn't pick that on purpose. It yeah. wasn't that we, on purpose, that we picked Never Telling the Die, knowing there's going to be a connection with Angel Town. We're just like, in Angel Town, like, oh my god! <laughs> 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 That's that guy! <laughs> <laughs> We get a fast scene, an important scene, because you know, can't forget about the school. I mean, he's here to do something. <laughs> That he's actually smart at math and he puts the engineering professor in his place while also referring to someone as a, a very bad, bad name for yeah. Middle Eastern <laughs> that people. It didn't age very yeah, well. I know, very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then he goes back to meet up with Martine and Henry and Mrs. Lee. Hey, Hi. Hey, yeah, 
that's where we have like the training scene because Martine's like, you're not a fighter. And then you see just how much of an absolute badass that Jacques is in mm-hmm. real life, which apparently in that period of time, he goes, there's like several different arenas inside of that gym where he can show off because in his fighting, because they go to a bunch of different places in different setups. And he's wearing different clothes. Yeah, he changes so he can go beat up uh, <laughs> random more people. <laughs> But he makes it back yes. in time for the wake for Mama Ordonius. <laughs> yes, of course. That's, uh, they're serving food. <laughs> I said the best cake. <laughs> <laughs> so we get, we start to get scenes now where we start to get a little bit more intimate with the di- with the gang that they're feuding with. And can I tell you guys something? The gang leader that they're feuding with, he's no show enough, man. I, I don't see it. This thing, no, it takes him way really, too long to to beat this guy. Yeah, they come in like sh- try to taunt him to come out. Then they shoot up the house. Henry, Jacques then goes to Henry, sets up a meeting with his quote unquote associate, a different gang, this like Asian gang, who knows all about the gangs in the area. They meet him in his limo and able to get some more information. But they, basically all that he gets is that Hey, don't worry about Angel. He's a puss. Yeah, that <laughs> without his Uzi, he's nothing. Is what that guy says. Yeah. So then Jacques breaks. Which good into... on Lee for having like Yakuza connections or something. <laughs> no, we find out later that he's paying protection money to the gang. Well, kind of, sort of. We find out he kind of oh. admits to it. But, like he admits to it with by not denying it. So then Jacques goes to Angel's house, holds him at knife point, tells him to leave the Ordonius family alone. Angel actually takes it to heart, tells his cronies to leave the Ordonius family alone. But then he goes and puts the body of his girlfriend slash getaway driver dead body inside of the Ordonius' house. So I don't know what the hell's going on here. He was scared at first, but then he wants to challenge him for more. All because his girlfriend laughed at him, I think. Yeah, she laughed at him because he was scared. Leaving his dead girlfriend's body at his house to, like, set him up. That just seems Mm. elaborate for a street gang. Like, wouldn't it be easier to just (laughs) shoot the house up again? (laughs) I'm just saying, like, the the gang leader's not the brightest bulb in the bunch. Like, maybe you shouldn't be trying to, like, set people up for murder. (laughs) Well, when Jacques and Henry come back and they find the body, both of them agree like yeah we should kill angel and and henry's like yeah we should do that yep very matter of fact like yeah he's dead and then i love like lee has his hookup with the yakuza come and just like clean up the body or something (laughs) that's what i thought at first too uh, uh, but then we find out later that jacques is the one he took the body himself back over to angel's house and put the body inside of the car so at that moment they decide, Henry and Jacques decide, they're just going to kill Angel without giving any information to Maria, who's in her house, like, trying to pick the, through the pieces of the house that bring back to her her and her son, who are staying at so- someone else's house. And Maria has been through some shit in this movie mm-hmm. so far. Through, the, in, through some shit in this movie and through some shit in real life. So, Teresa Saldana, she's most known for playing Lenore in The Raging Bull. She also played Rachel Scally on The Commish for 92 episodes between 91 and 96. She also founded an organization called Victims for Victim, and she founded it after surviving a nearly fatal knife attack by a deranged admirer. And it was actually shortly after she filmed Raging Bull, she was saved by a bottled water delivery man. So the Alhambra water guy jumped out, saved the day. They actually, he actually wanted to become a sheriff and they act, they fast-tracked his test for being a hero. He actually became a sheriff. A little weird side A little side story. So. <laughs> She dedicated her life since then to trying to help victims of victims of violent crimes and stuff like that. So, done a lot of good work. Now, on the downside, because of the stabbing, she lost out on the role in Tootsie to Gina Davis, which kind of got Gina Davis's career going. And then something a little weird. She was also in 15 episodes of the New Kids on the Block, 1990, the cartoon. So she must oh, have wow. voiced a character on oh, the... Wow. You guys remember that Saturday morning cartoon? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, it's on Melissa the remembers. <laughs> so. I do remember see, it. I watched see, it every I knew Saturday you guys morning. would know. So <laughs> no one that's listening to this knows. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but we know. We know. We hear we heard you, Teresa. We heard you every Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> so for real, for our anniversary, we did like a theme for 
something from your past, something that like a memory, something you can't live without. Yeah. And one of the things I got Melissa off of eBay was an original New Kids on the Block t-shirt from like that era because if she could, she would go on one of those cruises with the New Kids oh on the Block. Oh my god. <laughs> I don't even want to go on a cruise. I would go with the new kids on the block. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say like a pog or something. It's really <laughs> badass slammer. <laughs> got new kids on the block on it. Actually, I got a deep rabbit hole about pogs on eBay. I'm just saying if anyone's interested in getting me a gift, I will take pogs. <laughs> <laughs> Alf pogs? <laughs> Steve Allen only. <laughs> we take cash, credit card, and pogs. <laughs> I do, I do. I, I, I swear, I want Pogs. I do, I want it. After buying that pin putt game on eBay, I want Pogs. That's a date night right there, playing Pogs. <laughs> no. <laughs> Side note on that, on the Pogs, I'm pretty sure when, when me and John were kids, in the neighborhood we lived in in Modesto, one of the kids had this huge coin that he would use, and he would always win with it. And it wasn't like a Pog coin, like one of the, head, one of the weights was just this big coin. And I'm looking back, and I'm like, wait a minute. I think I know what that was. I think that was an AA coin. <laughs> His dad was an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny. So I, I'm just going to get this out of the way now. The only other guest star credit that seemed to be worth mentioning was Gregory Cruz. Who plays Stoner? Because his character actually doesn't have it. We never hear his character's name. He's that he plays the one of the guys that lives next door. He's just referred to as Stoner. Well, that's Gregory Cruz. And aside from playing Detective Stillwater on 44 episodes of Saving Grace, he has mostly played Native Americans. One of those Latin guys that looks just enough like he could be a Native American. <laughs> we have a really short scene where. Like, a seven-year-old is recruited to try and do a drive-by shooting on Jacques at the school. Yeah. Hits two other innocent people, and then he gets the kid, Jacques's able to rip the kid out, and chase another person down, but the driver escapes. But he makes that lady, just some random lady, hold the gun and the kid down. That is the best part of the scene. <laughs> Not that, like, the fighting or anything like that, it's that that black lady, who was, like, <laughs> just thrown into it. It's like, I want you to hold this kid and hold that car at gunpoint, and she's, like, on it. <laughs> yeah, come on. It. And she does until the police come. So now we're going to get into the part of the movie where Martine decides that he's going to stop trying to hide and actually try to do something. And he keeps trying to tell Jacques that he's going to do that. And Jacques keeps telling him no, but Martine's not having it anymore. He's going to go do something himself. Meanwhile, Jacques has gotten himself a badass Fiero. He just needs <laughs> to get it airbrushed now. <laughs> It's a slight chase scene where they, sorry, he first goes to school, parks in the park, they try and plant a bomb. Jacques, who doesn't give a fuck about USC, no. <laughs> figures yes. out the bomb's there and just hucks the bomb <laughs> further into the parking garage, <laughs> blowing a huge choke in it, and then just drives away like nothing happened. I have no connection to USC at all. <laughs> yes. Good thing there's no one, you know, walking up the ramp at that moment or pulling in. <laughs> Then there's a chase. He's able to outrun them by driving underneath a semi-truck where the car chasing him won't fit. Then gives chase on foot. The truckers help capture one. Then he catches the other by foot mm -hmm. and then is able to get some information out of him on what's going to happen. He finds out that, oh, Angel and the crew and the gang are going to hit Maria where she works and then burn the house down. Yes. And this is when things kind of all fall out, you know. They blow up the window at the karate dojo. They attack Maria at her work. This is when all the fallout, the gang's big plan comes together. and they. So the Maria thing was a surprise to me, actually, because I thought it was going to be more like... Because the whole movie's like chase scenes and then action with shock fighting. And the Maria scene is really, really dark, and you don't expect, like, it just, there's just, just sudden shit in the movie. Yeah, I thought yeah. they were going to kill her, which I know I'm saying that's probably dark, but that's kind of dark, but, <laughs> but not as dark as what they did. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, Martine is at the house, defending the house at gunpoint. No, because oh, he sees he his mom. He hasn't gotten there yet. He hasn't gotten there yet. He, mm -hmm. go, he goes, he finds, they both kind of get there at the same time. He sees his mom. We get to, the police are like, we can, we'll take you to see your mom, but we're not going to tell you anything that's happened. <laughs> he goes to see his we're mom. We're not going to tell mom. you that she's being raped. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Exactly. Damn it. <laughs> yeah, that's 
pretty much how the cop asks. He's like, uh, oh. Um, it goes and takes to see his mom. His mom tells him very specifically, go protect the house. Which is a very weird thing to tell your teenage son. Like, they're going to burn down the house. You better go there. <laughs> you better go over there. And stop oh, it. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. I had to deal with all this stuff to keep that house for you. You better go yeah, defend exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, I think I would have just told him, screw it. Yeah. You didn't even like the house anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so then he's upset. So this he leaves. Is... And he goes back to the house to protect it. And, and this is where I feel like we need to talk about. He is either a clo- uh, a former Green Beret or a former postal worker who lives next door. <laughs> yeah, he's um, clearly a military guy. <laughs> <laughs> so and throughout the whole movie, he is uh, he seems to really want to help, but is con- is is not capable because he is handicapped. Or at least that's the way he acts. So later we find that he is capable, more capable than he thinks he is. Well, Frank ends up being a badass, right? Yeah. Because he goes down, he gets his he gets from his arsenal, he gets his gun, goes out the back, to able to climb up on the fence, unlock the gate, and then pull himself up the stairs and come in through the back of the house mm-hmm. with his gun. And, and then on top of that, the gang doesn't have any guns for whatever reason. And Martin, he shoots one of in the leg but frank is ready to kill fools yeah no he's actually good with a gun too martin has that old like shotgun where he's got to load it up and do all that stuff and he's not good at shooting it he like wastes a bunch of bullets he only has like eight bullets or something they know and they're like oh that's only seven you only got seven left and they're like basically making fun of him (laughs) until frank gets there to help him (laughs) and then it's funny because multiple uh, because a number of them get shot during this process and it's like they were laughing at the beginning and so eight of them end up getting shot so (laughs) it's not 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 quite so funny (laughs) Jacques shows up then they start fighting they're gonna they're gonna lose though they are vastly outnumbered but that's when henry shows up with the cavalry then it turns into this huge brawl out on the street between the gang, Henry's dojo, Jacques, Martine, and mm-hmm. then Frank turns into this huge fight that's happening. And Jacques is just murdering fools. So is Henry, though. He's killing everybody, too. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the sense, like, it's oh, still yeah. even. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good old-fashioned East L.A. brawl. And they just, <laughs> they're he's snapping necks, he's sweeping the leg. And there's even this kind of cartoonish moment. In which he he like tricks into shooting his own guy, and then he throws a stick of dynamite into Angel's car and blows mm-hmm. up his car. In the end, after he beats the crap out of Angel a little bit, you know, gets him nice and primed, he lets Martin <laughs> finish beating the crap out of him in front of all his boys, and so all his boys end up losing respect for Angel. And then it ends with the cops then showing up and dispatching the helicopter, and everyone's because in a neighborhood like that, you don't talk to the police. No, no, no. no I mean, no. they all have an so, immediate. But I mean, like at that, that point, there must the be cops. like, yeah, exactly. Like, but like at that point, there must be like eight dead, ten dead people out there just in front of their house. <laughs> yeah, Angel's definitely dead. He don't get. He's dead. He's dead. Dead. <laughs> get up. <laughs> you know that might. I mean, the, he might be able to claim self defense, but Jacques might get his visa pulled and get sent back to France for this. <laughs> you know, they don't mess around in those immigration courts. <laughs> And that's the end of this movie, and that's why I'm still like on the fence because like it it starts off it starts off really poorly because it's for co- a combination of reasons. There's like the story and the acting stuff that we talked about with shock and and like there's some plot holes in the story in the very beginning as far as like his backstory. But there's also some really bad editing in the very beginning. Yeah. I think she's like all of a sudden jumping. The colors different in different cameras. So like the, this angle, the colors like this, and this angle, the colors. Really he was bad. learning. <laughs> but well, Eric we got to... better, and then we got Lionheart. <laughs> but by the time we get to the end of this movie, I think we end up with a pretty good action movie. I kind of came to the same conclusion. Like it was like by the end of it, it was kind of like, well, it actually wasn't that bad. It was almost good. Almost good. I think that's the best way to say it. It's almost good. <laughs> The most glowing review we can give it. It was almost good. It almost made it there. (laughs) Well, before we get into our final thoughts here, let's go talk about this week's music because this week's music is extremely special. It is a special music segment for a very special person who gets to take over and, and dominate the entire music segment. Let's go break it down. 
So, John, in the movie, there's this scene that we didn't talk about where he's at the college campus and there's a live band playing. And when we were watching it, me and Melissa were like, I hope this guy didn't do all of the music for this movie. <laughs> but then when you watch the end credits, I think we were on to something. Okay. What do you got for us this week? You guys are on to something. So there's something fishy going on. And when I'm looking at the soundtrack, I'm noticing all of the songs are either written and or arranged by Gil Carson. Gil Carson, spelled with a K. The director's name is Eric Carson, spelled with a K. I don't know if they're related or if it's coincidence. I'm just saying something seems a little funny here. Stuff and he wrote in. every song. It was just some of the songs were performed by different people. All right. Now, mind you, Gil Carson also worked as sound soundtracker music department and or wrote songs for Lionheart as well. That's Gil Carson with a K. Just like Eric Carson with a K. Um, <laughs> I don't know who's the older brother, who got who a job. I think the director's probably got more pull. So I think let's, let's just kind of get into a little bit. So you brought up that there was a band. I don't know exactly which band. Six of the songs were performed by the Hotheads. And there ain't nothing on the internet about the hotheads anymore. I look, I googled, and I used every trick I know. There are no hotheads, no bands called the hotheads prior to the 2000s. Yeah. So I have a sneaking suspicion, though, that the hotheads were Gill's band because they did the most songs. They did six songs. And we'll get back to Gill here in a minute. So there was one song that was performed by DV8. DV8 is still a Cincinnati-based cover band, and you can hire them today. They are available. <laughs> they're actually extremely, they actually got a pretty popular Facebook. And they actually look, their YouTube videos are pretty fun. Like, they actually would be a good show. Like, that, I'd go see that at a state fair. <laughs> so, yeah, so DV8 does a song. They still exist. They still exist. There was a song by Bertha E. Or a pizza, and she was also, I'm assuming it's a she, was also heavily involved with the Lionheart soundtrack as well. <laughs> and then there was one so there was one there was one song performed by a band called Cold Shot. Now, guys, Cold Shot never made it big. They tried, <laughs> they showed up in LA, they released some uh, a demo, things just never happened. But in 2014, the former lead singer Adam Murray was contacted and, by a record label and they remastered and re-released their demo tape, their 10-song demo tape on iTunes. So the world was reintroduced to Cold Shot. <laughs> now, I don't know how much attention or how many it got sold but it was good enough for dover someone at the dover post i believe or something to write an article about it and so uh pretty cool you know he 20 years after the band broke up and their music jumped back on the scene so of a band that just, just never made it it was a hair metal band that was going into the grunge era. So at least uh, Adam Murray still lives in Dover uh, on a farm with his wife, by the way. Mm -hmm. right. And then there was one song performed by Greg Alexander. Actually, Greg Alexander is a singer, songwriter, and producer. He was best known as the frontman of the New Radicals. They gave us the hit You Get What You Give in 1998. And he also won a Grammy for his song The Game of Love. He got into the production side after the New Radicals broke up in 99. So he actually has some clout. At the time he performed the song for the movie, he was working as a street performer in the park. Oh, damn. Yeah, so like he actually turned out to be somebody, unlike the... <laughs> So that leads us back to Gil Carson. <laughs> so Gil Carson, uh, aside from working on the soundtrack here and possibly being the lead singer of the Hotheads, speculating, uh, <laughs> he was also involved in the soundtracker music department of <laughs> Lionheart, a movie called Smoke N Lightning, as in the letter N and lightning spelled <laughs> without a G. That's got to have <laughs> Burt Reynolds in it. That's got to have Burt in it. <laughs> Somehow he was involved with Eddie with Whoopi Goldberg. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but he is actually still performing shows as Gil Carson. 
in his local Bakersfield, California area. He seems to be a regular at the Pine Mountain Club, but unfortunately, not much, uh, at least not much has been posted on his Facebook since about February, and we all know what happened in February. So, uh, hoping the best for good old Gil, and maybe if I'm ever in Bakersfield, I'll catch him at the Pine Mountain Club. Listen, there's like three places that I've been to in my life where I, I went there and I'm like, listen, I'm never coming back to this place. There's, it's just never happening. <laughs> and Bakersfield is on that list. <laughs> uh, guys, I'm pretty sure Bakersfield, Dover, and Cincinnati are all on that list. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that know what I'm talking about, and John, you're going to know exactly this too. Of all the music that's in here, the cover band is the most exciting. Because if you've ever seen a good cover band, a great one, they are so much fun. And that's like one of the things, like the stupid lockdown. It's one of the things that I miss, like going out and seeing live music. And there is nothing like like a fair or at a bar or at a, a street festival or something like that. And a good cover band is performing. Mm -hmm. It is so much fun. Yeah, and that's what I'm telling you. When I was looking at the videos uh, on YouTube of DV8, it looked like a hell of a lot of fun. All the music dv8 was the one where it was like that's the one i'd want to see yeah. although cold shot did get my attention just just because they they got re-released it's like really like, okay <laughs> well, maybe i need to listen to that song again well I wonder, if, re I wonder if gil carson does covers of angel town <laughs> <laughs> speaking of a resurgence let's go give our final thoughts on this movie and see if it's due or, I don't know, everything's getting a remake now. Will it get what? a remake? <laughs> no, I answered the question. It's not getting a remake. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts. Oh, no. We're getting a cyborg nemesis. Oh. <laughs> True story. <laughs> yes. All right. I'm going to start this week with the final thoughts. I have some final thoughts on this. I'm still on the fence about it. I can't make up my mind about this movie. You don't have thoughts on it. You're wishy-washy. <laughs> the one thing that Melissa and I talked about after watching this movie that is, it, it, I as it got to the end, it actually turned into a pretty solid action movie. Not like some big summer blockbuster. Not like a good one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but for the 90s or early 90s and an action movie like this, if you got this at Blockbuster, you'd be happy as it was w w one of the movies that you picked out for the weekend. Because it, it delivers on what it promises when it comes to action. What is mysterious about this movie is that you could remove Jacques and still have the same movie and it'd be just <laughs> as good without Jacques, which is a really weird thing to say that he's the, he's the star of the movie and he is absolutely 100% expendable. <laughs> In fact, and I think most will go further into this, the movie would have been better if the movie was about Henry. Exactly. So Melissa... What are your final thoughts on this movie? I think that the, the side characters were better than the actual main character, and he was not needed. He hurt the movie. <laughs> Listen, I know he's good at karate. I get it. He can kill people. <laughs> so, like, literally, that's all he does the whole movie. Even when he's a teenager in his flashbacks, he's killing people. I get it. He's good at karate. He is not so good at the acting. <laughs> like, not at all. At all, at all. Like, a potato would have been <laughs> the same range. I think that the story would have been better, and we talked about this after we watched the movie, if they had made it like, why did they need him in there at all? Henry knows karate. Henry knew Martine's dad. He, they were friends. It could have been like, Martine goes to Henry, finds out he was my, you know, that's my dad's old friend. I want him to teach me karate because I want to protect my family. Then Henry's like, oh, you're in over your head. I, can, I need to help you. And then Henry could be the one to beat the crap out of Angel because he's just as good at karate as as the but main isn't that is. one of the karate kids? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm like, don't get me started, because that's not a karate kid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just saying, they made like four of them. I'm pretty sure one of them was pretty much that. <laughs> no. No. One is... <laughs> goes through all of them. <laughs> Two is the best one. Three's with the girl. You know no, we're mixing up? <laughs> this is probably a three ninjas. Yes, there we go. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> Anyways, yes. Uh, where but, did you go, Jonathan Taylor Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> 
Anyways, I think the movie would. The bottom line is, it's not a bad movie. It's a good action movie. It has a plot that goes nowhere and fast and goes straight to the toilet <laughs> because. <laughs> but, I mean, I watched the whole thing, so there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't stop watching it. <laughs> Just kidding. No, but I, like I said, I thought it would have been better if they didn't have him in there at all. It didn't make any sense. He didn't do anything in college. He's never going to get that <laughs> master's degree or whatever he's going for. He's just too dumb. I don't believe for a second he could be an engineer anything. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? All right, so it's just I'm going to take it to a serious place for a minute. So somewhere <laughs> deep down, behind all the bad acting and the low budgetness, there actually was a little bit of solid, meaningful idea there about these people who get stuck in this that's become a very poor or bad neighborhood and they feel trapped in their house because they can't sell it anymore. They can't. They can't. They can't escape these areas. So, like, I see what Eric Carlson uh, with a K was going for. <laughs> Like, I, I see what he was going for with the movie, and for the most part, you know, like, there's definitely some, like, the stuff with the school could just go. But as far as, like, the battle with the gangs and stuff, like, I, I could see the framework of what would be a good movie. But you get distracted through the movie with, you know, the the flashbacks and discount Jean-Claude Van Damme, uh, which <laughs> who I still feel really bad for. I see what they were going for, and so it's it's like we were talking about earlier, even before we started recording. Like, uh, like I I understand they were like like we almost got something here, and then that's when they went for Lionheart because it's like you could see like we're close. We're not. We, we still got to figure some things out as far as like how to make this movie, but like we're getting closer. What bugs me is that like then they did Lionheart, they made a little bit of money. And then, like, that was it. Like, like there's no... <laughs> so, it, I, I guess I guess what I'm saying is, like, it, it was never going to turn into, like, a Marvel movie kind of systematic, you know, like, do this kind of deal. So, but I'm surprised oh we didn't get at least two or three other discount JVDs after Lionheart worked. Yeah, I just, I'm just imagining the Lionheart expanded universe of all these French soldiers <laughs> that come to you. To fight off gangs in L.A. Exactly. Exactly. Because, I mean, there are other badass Frenchmen. George St. Pierre, uh, he's <laughs> French-Canadian. Um, he's a badass French and badass Canadian, which that makes him an extremely minority. <laughs> I wonder how good he is at shooting while he's... <laughs> 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 I don't know. I bet you he's better with a broom. <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, gowiththeheat at gmail.com. Check out our website, gowiththeheat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to subscribe, all the ways that you can support the show. Support step number one. Email us, gowiththeheat at gmail.com. We would love, love, love to hear from you. What do you think of Angel Town? What do you think of Olivier Gruner? What do you think about this movie being turned into Lionheart? <laughs> we want to hear your thoughts. Support step number two. Leave us a review at your podcast, your platform of choice. Wherever it is that you get podcasts, go leave us a review. Just give us five stars. No one's going to know I told you that. Just go give us five stars. And then in the review, instead of writing a review of the show, write in there what happened in Hong Kong. We all know. <laughs> Be graphic. <laughs> <I> go deep. <laughs> really suss out what happened in Hong Kong. <laughs> Because they might want to check on all the Lee's kids. Just saying. Like, they might want to check in on that. <laughs> if one of them talks with a bad French accent. <laughs> and a bad bowl cut. Go leave that review at your podcast, your platform of choice. Support step number two. You can send us money. We'll take it. You go, there's a PayPal me. There's a or Pogs. Cash. <laughs> yeah, I will take Pogs. If you email me and say you're going to buy me Pogs, I will give you my home address. Send me Pogs. I will take them. Even better if they're like action movie Pogs. Like, I'll take them. Action movies yes. or that cartoon show, which I can never remember the name of, where they're like Power Extreme. And then, like, all the stuff snaps onto them and they can, like, turn into other, like, cars and motorcycles and all these like like electronic stuff can attach what to the them. Hell you're talking about? People help me yeah, out here. That's... I know that's... Thundercats and I know Voltron. I don't know all kinds of what you're talking about. 
Hold on. I don't care how discount they were. They were called the Centurions. There we go. I almost bought That's you those, right, but I wasn't sure those were the right thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Centurions. I want Centurion's Pogs. If you find Centurion Pogs, <laughs> I want it. <laughs> I'll find a Centurion. Send them to me. <laughs> yeah, that you can just get the TV show. I can't find that shit anywhere. It's like impossible to find. Yeah. It's not on any streaming services. I will take it. I want it. I'm reading about it. I'm distracted. <laughs> it usually aired in 1986. So support step number two, send me Pogs. Support step number three. Tell other people about the show. That's how other people find it. Not about us. the Pogs, though. <laughs> That's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell them about DVA since that is number go. one cover rock band. <laughs> tell me about the show. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals. All right, so with shit, you can't find the Centurions anywhere. Like, they're not for sale anywhere. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was just like discount G.I. Joe's mom got a KB. <laughs> like, I, I, like, I, 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 I don't remember much about a show. <laughs>